Chapter 8 is all about gases. There are a variety of properties of gases that we're going to be talking about, one of which is pressure. The definition of pressure is that it's force per unit area. So we could write an equation, pressure P equals force F divided by area A. Something to keep in mind as we talk about pressure is that the atmospheric pressure is always pushing down on us and our reactions. That is the pressure from the atmosphere above us. And it's actually not insignificant. In fact, it's the same amount of pressure as a bowling ball pressing on an area the size of your thumbnail. The reason why we don't feel it so much is we're used to it. We're designed for this particular type of pressure. And if we were to have a bowling ball on our thumbnail, that would actually be doubling the amount of pressure that our thumbnail would be feeling. There are a lot of different units for pressure. The Pascal is the official IUPAC unit and it's equal to one Newton per meter squared. Newton is a unit of force, meter squared is a unit of area. So Newton per meter squared is force per area. Kilopascal is a similar version, but it's just a thousand pascals. Pounds per square inch is abbreviated PSI. And you'll hear that in sort of popular culture and just for reference, the air pressure at sea level is 14.7 PSI. Another unit of pressure is the atmosphere. The atmosphere as a unit of pressure is equal to 101,325 pascals. The atmosphere is really a intuitive unit of pressure because the air pressure at sea level is equal to one atmosphere of pressure. So most of our experiments are going to be assumed to be done at one atmosphere of pressure. One bar is equal to exactly 100,000 pascals. So the bar and the atmosphere are very similar. It's just that the bar is linked up with the pascal. It's going to be exactly 100,000 pascals. And so bar is a common unit used in meteorology. Millibar is another version we could use. 1,000 millibars is equal to one bar. Another common unit that you'll hear referred to is inches of mercury. In, an inch of mercury is equal to 3,386 pascals. The inches of mercury unit is used on weather.com, for example. Four is equal to one over 760 atmospheres. In other words, one atmosphere is equal to 760 tor. This is going to be a very important and common conversion that we're going to use in this chapter. The tor is named after Torricelli, the inventor of the barometer. And then our last unit that we wanted to mention is millimeters of mercury. And one millimeter of mercury is approximately the same thing as one tor. So I'll be using them interchangeably. The way we measure atmospheric pressure is with a barometer. So a barometer has a tube usually made of glass and is inserted into a pool of liquid. The atmospheric pressure pushes on the pool of liquid and pushes some of that liquid up into that glass column and the height of the liquid in the column corresponds to a particular pressure. So we can actually calculate what that pressure is using the equation P equals HDG, where P is the pressure in pascals. Remember, a pascal is equal to a newton per meter squared. Another conversion that we can use for pascals is kilogram per meter times second squared. The height H is going to be in meters, and D is the density of the liquid. So most of our columns include mercury as the liquid, but it could be other liquids such as water. And the units that density needs to be expressed in for this equation are going to be kilograms per cubic meter. 
And then the last thing is going to be g, the gravitational constant, which is 9.8 meters per second squared. So as we use this equation, it's going to be really important to have our units um, canceling out properly. So we need to get everything in the correct units before we plug it into the equation. The reason why mercury is the most common fluid used in a barometer is that it's very dense. And so since the density is high, then the height of the column can be lower. So we can have smaller barometers made of mercury compared to water, which would need a much larger barometer. So here's an example of calculating pressure with a barometer. We're trying to show that atmospheric pressure is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. And the density of mercury is given as 13.6 grams per cubic centimeter. So as we plug into our equation, h, the height of the mercury in the column, is going to be our 760 millimeters. However, before we plug it into our equation, we need to get it into meters. So we're going to multiply by 10 to the minus 3, and that gives us 0 0.760 meters. d, the density, is given to us in units of grams per cubic centimeter. We need it in kilograms per cubic meter. So we're going to have to do a bit of tricky conversion factors here. So first of all, we need to get grams into kilograms. So grams will go on the bottom to cancel out, and kilograms will go on the top. And 10 to the third is equal to kilo, so that 10 to the third goes next to our base unit of grams. Then we need to get cubic centimeters into cubic meters. And this is the real tricky part here. So first of all, since we have the cubic centimeters in the denominator of our original unit, we're going to need to have the cubic centimeters in the numerator of the conversion factor in order to cancel out with it. And what we're going to do is we're going to write our usual conversion factor going from centimeters to meters. So one centimeter is equal to 10 to the minus two meters. And then to get it to be cubic, we're going to cube the whole conversion factor. When we cube the whole conversion factor, that not only cubes the units so that we get cubic centimeters and cubic meters, it's also gonna cube any numbers that are inside the conversion factor. So that 10 to the minus two gets cubed. And so we end up with 10 to the minus six in the denominator of that conversion factor. So we would have 13.6, and then we would divide by 10 to the third, and then we would be dividing again by 10 to the minus 6, and that would give us 13,600 kilograms per cubic meter. So now we have everything in the correct units to plug into our P equals HDG equation. We plug in our height in meters, we plug in our density in kilograms per cubic meter, and we plug in the gravitational constant, which is in meters per second squared. So we come out with 101,292.8 pascals as our pressure. And if we look at our table a few slides back, you'll notice that that is approximately the same thing as 760 millimeters mercury, is approximately the same thing as one atmosphere of pressure. So they're all going to be equivalent uh, in terms of the amount that they're talking about. So here's a question for you to try. You're using the equation P equals HDG to find the pressure in a barometer. You're given the height, you're given a density, and you're given the gravitational constant. The correct answer is B, 7.26 atmospheres. So this problem is done basically the same as the previous. 
the there are a few differences. One is that we don't have to change the height into meters because it's already given to us in meters. And then the other is that our column is filled with water instead of mercury. So the density is different. Um, it actually is a little bit easier to calculate because the density is one gram per cubic centimeter. But we're still going to have to cube our whole conversion factor going from centimeters to meters uh, so that we can get cubic centimeters going to cubic meters. Uh, so that uh, 10 to the minus 2 gets cubed. If we want to measure the pressure of gas trapped in a container, we would use a manometer. There are a few different types of manometers. They could have a closed end or an open end. And the equations for measuring the pressure are pretty similar to the one for a barometer, but there are some modifications. So if there's a closed end and a vacuum, the equation is the exact same. Pressure equals H times density times the gravitational constant. If there's an open end, then we're going to have to uh, add the atmospheric pressure and either subtract HDG or add HDG, depending on whether the uh, liquid in the column level is lower on the side that's open to the atmosphere or higher on the side open to the atmosphere. So if it's lower on the side open to the atmosphere, we're going to subtract HDG. And if it's higher on the side open to the atmosphere, we're going to add HDG. So in this section, we're going to be talking about gas laws. So we'll start with four basic gas laws, and then we'll combine them all together. So our four basic gas laws are Amontin's law, which relates pressure and temperature, Charles's law, which relates volume and temperature, Boyle's law, which relates volume and pressure, and Avogadro's law, which relates volume and moles. We're going to combine all of those together into what we call the ideal gas law, which relates pressure, volume, moles, and temperature all at the same time. Our first gas law is Montan's law. Montan's law tells us that pressure and temperature are directly proportional. So as one goes up, the other goes up. As one goes down, the other goes down. So we could write this as an equation. Pressure is proportional to temperature. Or we could write it as an equality equation. Pressure is equal to some constant times temperature. Now this is going to be true in a variety of different circumstances. So let's say we had circumstance one. Pressure one is equal to constant times temperature one. Pressure two in a new set of circumstances would equal to that same constant times temperature two. So we can rearrange those equations and solve for the constant. So we divide both sides by the temperature. So we get constant equals pressure one divided by temperature one, constant equals pressure two divided by temperature two. And it's the same constant in both cases. So since it's the same, we can set the thing on the other side of the equal sign equal to each other. So pressure one over temperature one equals pressure two over temperature two. And this is going to be the form of the equation that we're most likely to use, the before and after set of equations. We have a before set of circumstances, which is labeled with one, and an after set of circumstances, which is labeled with two. So if you look at the picture, we have a hot plate that is off and the pressure is low for that gas. When the hot plate is on medium heat, the pressure is about medium. And when the hot plate is on high, the temperature or the pressure is high. So as the temperature went up, the pressure went up. They're directly proportional. So we can graph the data for Amontin's law. We should get a nice straight line. We could put pressure on our y-axis and temperature on our x or the other way around. Either way, we should get a nice straight line. And uh, as the temperature goes up, the pressure goes up and vice versa. 
this assumes that moles and volume are held constant. If those two things are not held constant, then we can't use Amontan's law the way it is. So we do make some assumptions as we use Amontan's law. Let's look at an example using Amontan's law. So we have a can of hairspray that contains some isobutane gas. And the can has a warning label that says, store only at temperatures below 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Do not incinerate. Question is why? So Amontan's law tells us that as temperature increases, pressure also increases. So the hotter it gets, the higher the pressure. And eventually, it could be so much pressure that the can could explode. And we can actually do some calculations using Amontan's law. The gas in the can is initially 24 degrees Celsius and 360 kilopascals of pressure. And the can has a volume of 350 milliliters. The question is, what is the new pressure when the temperature reaches 50 degrees Celsius? So we're going to use our equation so we need to identify our variables. T1 is going to be our 24 degrees Celsius plus 273.15 to get it into Kelvin. Anytime that we use any of our gas laws, the temperatures have to be in Kelvin. So if they're given in Celsius, convert it into Kelvin. So we come out with the T1 of 297.15 Kelvin. P1 is 360 kilopascals. For the pressures, it's not going to matter generally what unit of pressure you use as long as you're consistent with it. So as long as we're doing any sort of before and after set of equations, as long as we're consistent with our units of pressure, it doesn't really matter what they are. For the T2, again, we have to get it into Kelvin, so we take our uh, final temperature of 50 degrees Celsius and add to 73.15, and that gives us 323.15 Kelvin. So we're going to plug it into Montan's law, which is P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. But we can't really plug it in as is. It's better if you rearrange the equation and then plug in your variables. So what we need to solve for is the new pressure in the can, P2. So we need to get P2 by itself on one side of the equal sign. To do that, we would multiply both sides by T2. So we come out with P2 equals P1 times T2 divided by T1. Then we can plug in our actual values. So the P1 and the T2 go on the top. We plug in the T1 on the bottom. And we come out with 391 kilopascals. For all of our gas laws, we should be able to make some sense of our answer based on the relationships we know between the variables. So we know as temperature goes up, the pressure should also go up. And in fact, it does. It goes up from 360 to 391. Our second gas law is Charles's law. Charles's law tells us that volume and temperature are directly proportional to each other. So as volume goes up, temperature goes up, and so on. So again, we could write it as a proportionality equation, or we could write it as an equals equation as long as we put in a constant. So we could write volume equals some constant times temperature. This could be true in a variety of different circumstances. So we could have V1 equals constant times T1, V2 equals constant times T2. We could rearrange those and solve for constant and then set them equal to each other. And we come out with V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. So that's the form of Charles's law that we're likely to use. Uh, I encourage you to uh, go to the slides and click on the link that says liquid nitrogen balloon video. There's a fun video for you to watch. Um, and liquid nitrogen cools the balloon down. So I have in picture form something similar to what the video shows. At a higher temperature, let's say room temperature, the balloon is fully inflated. 
but at a lower temperature, when we pour on the really cold liquid nitrogen, the balloon kind of compacts. It crumples up because it's losing volume. At the lower temperature, its volume is decreased. So we can graph the Charles's law data. We could put volume on the x-axis and temperature, or t volume on the y-axis and temperature on the x, or vice versa. It doesn't really matter. Um, but as we graph it, we should get a nice straight line. And um, the temperature does need to be in Kelvin as we make these graphs. So um, Charles's law, similar to Amante's law, is going to make some assumptions. So the assumptions for Charles's law is that moles and pressure are being held constant. So as long as those two variables are held constant, the other two variables, temperature and volume, can vary with each other and they're going to vary in this linear manner. So let's look at an example calculation. We have a sample of carbon dioxide that takes up 0 0.300 liters at 10 degrees Celsius and 750 torr. The question is what volume will the gas have at 30 degrees Celsius and 750 torr? So the 750 torr is just there to tell us that the pressure is being held constant. So Charles's law does apply. What we really need is just volume and temperature here. So our V1, our initial volume is 0 0.300 liters. T1 is our 10 degrees Celsius plus 273.15, which makes 283.15 Kelvin. And T2, our new temperature, again, we have to get it into Kelvin is going to be 30 plus 273.15, which makes 303.15 Kelvin. Then we're plugging into our Charles' Law equation, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. And we're going to identify which variable we're trying to solve for. In this case, we're trying to find the new volume, <coughs> V2. So we need to get V2 by itself on one side of the equal sign. To do that, we're going to multiply both sides by T2. So we get V2 equals V1 times T2 divided by T1. Then we can plug in our values. The V1 and the T2 are on the top. The T1 is on the bottom. Again, we have our units correct, so the temperature is in Kelvin. And the volume doesn't really matter as long as we're consistent about it as long as we're doing one of these before and after equations. So it's in liters, which means our answer is going to be in liters. And we come out with 0 0.321 liters. So here's a question for you. We have a balloon that was blown up in the morning when the temperature is 23 degrees Celsius. And in the morning, it has a volume of 1.50 liters. Then it's left in a hot car and inflates to a new volume of 1.56 liters. The question is, what is the new temperature in the car? The answer is D, 34.8 degrees Celsius. Remember, as you're using the equation, the temperature has to be in Kelvin. So you would need to change your 23 degrees Celsius into Kelvin to use the equation. But then the answer that you get out of the equation will also be in Kelvin. So at the end, you'll have to change from Kelvin into Celsius by subtracting 273.15. Our third gas law is Boyle's law, which tells us that volume and pressure are inversely proportional. So as one goes up, the other goes down. This is the only one of our four individual gas laws that has an inverse proportionality. So we can write our equation as pressure is proportional to one over volume, or we could say pressure is equal to some constant times one over volume. And this is going to be true in a variety of different circumstances. So pressure one equals constant times one over volume one, pressure 2 equals constant times 1 over volume 2. And we could set those constants equal to each other. 
and we end up with P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. So because of the inverse proportionality, this is the only one where we're going to multiply the things on each side of the equation rather than dividing. So we can graph Boyle's law data, but if we were to graph pressure versus volume, we would get a curve that's not a straight line. So because of the inverse proportionality, if we want a straight line, we need to graph one over pressure versus volume or pressure versus one over volume to get a straight line. And what you'll notice is that as the pressure increases, the volume decreases. As the volume increases, the pressure decreases. And just like with all our other individual gas laws, we are making some assumptions. Since we're varying volume and pressure, moles and temperature are being held constant. So Boyle's law is important for a lot of different things, including breathing. So when you're trying to breathe in, your diaphragm is going to contract. When it contracts, it expands the lungs. So they get a larger volume. And because they have a larger volume, the pressure drops inside the lungs. So that smaller pressure inside the lungs compared to the outside pressure means that air is going to flow into the lungs. So you breathe in. Then when you're trying to breathe out, the diaphragm relaxes, which pushes the lungs smaller again. So with that smaller volume, the pressure is increased and that forces the air out of the lungs. So here's an example using Boyle's law to do the calculation. We have a gas at 15 milliliters and a pressure of 13 PSI. We want to find the new pressure when the volume is seven and a half milliliters. So our V1 is 15 milliliters. And again, with pressures and volumes, it doesn't really matter what our units are as long as we're consistent. So we can leave it in milliliters because we have a before and after set of equations. For the P1, we can leave it as 13 PSI. For the V2, we have seven and a half milliliters. So we plug that into our equation P1 V1 equals P2 V2. But before we plug it in, we need to get the variable we're solving for by itself on one side of the equal sign. We're trying to find the new pressure P2. So to get it by itself, we divide both sides by V2. So we get P2 equals P1 times V1 divided by V2. We plug in our values in the correct spots and come out with 26 PSI. This should make sense. We're decreasing our volume. We're actually cutting our volume in half. So we expect that our pressure should double, and it does. Our fourth gas law is Avogadro's law, which tells us that volume and moles are directly proportional. So as moles go up, the volume also goes up. So we can again express this as a before and after set of equations, V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. Um, now with Avogadro's law, we may do some calculations like that, um, but we'll do some different ones as well based on the concept of Avogadro's law. So let's talk about the concept a little bit. Remember with our balanced chemical equations, the coefficients can tell us the number of moles in the reaction, the number of molecules in the reaction, um, because uh, they're all going to be uh, the same like, ratios. Uh, so three moles of H2 reacts with one mole of N2 to make two moles of NH3. Or we could say the same thing with molecules. Well, now we can add on another aspect. Since volume and moles are directly proportional, we can also use our coefficients with relationship to volumes. So we could say three volumes of H2 gas react with one volume of N2 gas to make two volumes of ammonia gas. This is only true for gases. 
So keep that in mind. You can't necessarily do it for volumes of solids or liquids or aqueous solutions. This is only for gases. But with gases, you can use those coefficients to represent volumes. And this is actually pretty interesting. So on the left side of our arrow, we have four boxes representing four volumes. Whereas on the right side of our arrow, we have two boxes representing two volumes. So our volume is getting smaller over the course of the reaction. So just based on the chemical equation, you should be able to predict that, let's say this was happening in a balloon, the balloon should shrink because the number of moles at the end is less. So I like to think of molecules as Amazon boxes. They're going to be all essentially the same size. They may contain different things, um, just like you could have a plate or a lamp or an alarm clock fitting in the same size box. But uh, at the end of the day, the box is still the same size. And so the volumes of each molecule are going to be treated as if they're all the same size, regardless of what type of molecule it is. So we've talked about our four gas laws, and now we can combine them together such that we can solve for any of the four variables. We've talked about a Montan's law, P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. We've talked about Charles's law, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. We've talked about Boyle's law, which is P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. And we've talked about Avogadro's law, V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. So as we combine them together, we're going to look at where these variables are, whether it's in the numerator or the denominator. So in each of our equations, pressure is in the numerator, uh, in Amontin's law and Boyle's law. So in our combined gas law, pressure will be in the numerator. Volume is in the numerator of Charles's law, Boyle's law, and Avogadro's law. So volume is in the numerator in our combined gas law. Moles is in the bottom, the denominator of Avogadro's law, so it's in the denominator of the combined gas law. And temperature is in the denominator of both the Montan's and Charles's law, so it's in the denominator of the combined gas law. So our combined gas law is P1 V1 over N1 T1 equals P2 V2 over N2 T2. And the great thing about the combined gas law is that once you know the combined gas law, you can solve for any of the other gas laws just by canceling out the variables you don't need. So let's say we didn't need moles or temperature. So we could cross off moles, we could cross off temperature in our combined gas law, and we would be left with P1V1 equals P2V2, which is Boyle's law. And remember, Boyle's law assumes moles and temperature are held constant. So if we're holding them constant, we can cross them out of the combined gas law and just use the variables that are left. So here's an example of using the combined gas law. We have a scuba diver that has a tank filled with 13.2 liters of air, and it's pressurized to 153 atmospheres. It's a compressed air tank. And the water temperature is 27 degrees Celsius. What we want to find is how many liters of air can be delivered to the diver's lungs. And it's gonna be down in the ocean, uh, and deeper in the ocean, the pressure is going to be 3.13 atmospheres. Remember, at sea level, the pressure is about one atmosphere. So down deeper with the water pressure on top, the pressure is increased. 
uh, but notice it's not increased relative to the amount of pressure in the tank. The tank is very compressed. So we need to identify our variables. P1, the initial pressure of the air in the tank is 153 atmospheres. V1, the volume of air in the tank is 13.2 liters. And T1, we're going to get it into Kelvin. So that's 27 plus 273.15, which makes 300.15 Kelvin. The twos are a little bit trickier to identify. They're going to be based on the conditions in the diver's lungs. So in the diver's lungs, down deep in the ocean, there's going to be a pressure of 3.13 atmospheres. And then T2, the temperature in the diver's lungs is going to be body temperature, which is 37 degrees Celsius. So we take that 37 degrees Celsius and add 273.15 and get 310.15 Kelvin. That body temperature of 37 degrees Celsius is one of the ones I mentioned in chapter one that you should know. N is going to be a constant. Number of moles should be the same. So we're going to assume that none of the air escapes on the way from the tank to the diver's lungs. So we're going to actually cross off N from our combined gas law. So we start with our combined gas law and we cross off N and we're left with P1 V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2. So then we're going to plug in our actual values into this equation. Uh, but before we do, we are going to want to rearrange it to get the variable we're trying to solve for isolated on one side of the equal sign. So we know uh, pressure and temperature two, so volume two is what we're solving for, V2. To get it by itself, we're going to need to multiply both sides by T2 and divide both sides by P2. So our rearranged equation becomes V2 equals P1 times V1 times T2 divided by T1 P2. Then we can just plug in our values. Again, we've made sure our temperature is in Kelvin. The pressure and the volume we can leave as is. And make sure you put them in the right place with the ones and the twos in the correct spot in the equation. So we come out with 667 liters. With our combined gas law, we can't necessarily intuit what the answer will be because there are a lot of different variables. Um, but we can just make sure that we're being consistent about how we do the problem. Again, if you struggle with algebra, go back and study it because it's going to be really important to be able to rearrange these equations properly. We've combined our gas laws together in one way based on our before and after set of equations. We can combine them together in a different way based on our proportionality equations. So the ideal gas law is not going to be a before and after type equation. It's just going to be one set of circumstances where if we know three of the variables, we can solve for the fourth one. So we've talked about Monton's law, which says pressure and temperature are directly proportional. We've talked about Charles's law, which says volume and temperature are directly proportional. We've talked about Boyle's law, which says pressure and volume are inversely proportional. And we've talked about Avogadro's law, which says volume and moles are directly proportional. We could write those as equality equations with C a constant. And uh, we're going to kind of combine these together by looking at which side of the equal sign things are on. Before we do that, we want to rearrange Boyle's law so that everything is in the numerator. So we multiply both sides by V and we get PV equals our constant C. Now that everything is in the numerator, we can compare them and see which things are on which side of the equal sign. So pressure is on the left side of the equal sign in Amontons and Boyle's law. 
so it's on the left side in the ideal gas law. Charles's law and the rearranged Boyle's law and Avogadro's law all have volume on the left. So volume goes on the left in the ideal gas law. N, number of moles, is on the right in Avogadro's law, so it's on the right in our ideal gas law. And temperature is on the right in Amontin's and Charles's law, so it ends up on the right in the ideal gas law. We also have a constant, which I've generally been labeling C for constant, um, and that's on the right side of each equal sign. So that also ends up in our ideal gas law. We just change the way it's represented. So typically in the ideal gas law, the constant is represented by the capital R. So R is the ideal gas law constant. And that constant is going to depend on which units we use for pressure and volume. Remember, moles is always going to be moles, and temperature is always going to be Kelvin but the pressure and volume could be some different units. So here are a couple typical values for R. If we're using liters for our volume and atmospheres for our pressure, then we can use the value 0 0.08206. And the unit for R would be liters, atmospheres per mole Kelvin. We have these units um, because they're the units needed to cancel out the other units in the equation. Another common unit for R has liters kilopascals per mole Kelvin. So if the volume's in liters and the pressure is in kilopascals, we could use the value of 8.314. So here's an example using the ideal gas law. We're trying to replace gasoline with methane, and we want to find what volume the methane would take up. So one gallon of gasoline could be replaced by 655 grams of methane. And we want to find how much methane uh, volume would take up at 25 degrees Celsius and 745 torr. And we're given the value for R. You do not need to memorize the value for R. It will be given in the problem. So we're using our ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. But before we can do it, we need to get things into units that we're able to use. So pressure is given to us in TOR, but the two choices I gave you on the previous slide were atmospheres and kilopascals. So if you want to use one of those two, um, you would need to get it out of TOR. And in fact, the one given to us on this slide is the one with atmospheres. So we need to get from TOR into atmospheres. So we use the relationship that one atmosphere is equal to 760 torr. As I mentioned earlier in the chapter, this is going to be a very important conversion to be able to use. So since we're starting with torr, torr goes on the bottom, and that 760 is along with it. So we do 745 divided by 760, and that gives us 0 0.9803 atmospheres. So now we have our pressure in a unit that matches up with our R units. N is number of moles. We're given the grams of methane, so we need to get grams of methane into moles of methane, and we do that by dividing by the molar mass of methane, which ends up being 16.043. Again, if it's not given the problem, you have to um, create it from the periodic table. So we do 655, divided by 16.043, and that gives us 40.8278 moles of methane. So we have atmospheres, we have moles. Our temperature needs to be in Kelvin. So we take our 25 degrees Celsius and add 273.15, and that gives us 298.15 Kelvin. Now we have all of the units that we need to plug into our equation. And we're going to rearrange the ideal gas law to solve for the unit that we need. We're trying to solve for volume, so we need volume by itself. To do that, we would divide both sides by P. 
So we get volume equals nRT divided by P. Then we can plug in our values. We plug in our number of moles, which is 40.8278. We plug in the value for R, 0 0.08206 liters atmospheres per mole Kelvin. We plug in our temperature, which is 298.15 Kelvin. And then on the bottom, we have our 0 0.9803 atmospheres of pressure. So when we do that calculation, we get 1,019 liters. So this is why we don't generally use methane in our cars, because it would take up so much volume compared to just the one gallon of gasoline. Some vehicles do actually use compressed methane, compressed natural gas. So if you see some of the vehicles driving around the city, let's say that they use compressed gas or compressed natural gas. This is what they're using. Um, and that you're using it because it burns a lot cleaner than gasoline. Um, but it has to be compressed in order for it to fit in the vehicle. In this question, you're using the ideal gas law to find an unknown volume when you know the moles, the temperature, the pressure, and the gas constant R. The correct answer is B, 15.2 liters. So again, we're rearranging the ideal gas law equation to solve for volume. And uh, again, make sure that you have the units correct before you plug in. So change your degrees Celsius into Kelvin, but basically all the other units match up with the units for R, so you don't need to change the rest. Scientists have agreed on a set of conditions called standard temperature and pressure. And those are gonna be equal to one atmosphere of pressure and zero degrees Celsius. So we can take that set of conditions and find out what volume one mole of an ideal gas at standard temperature and pressure, or STP for short, would take up. To do that, we're using our ideal gas law, but we're rearranging it to solve for volume. So we get volume equals NRT divided by P. We can plug in our values. Since we're trying to find the amount for one mole, then one mole is our N. We're going to use the 0 0.08206 liters atmospheres per mole Kelvin as our R. Our temperature in Kelvin is 273.15. That's equivalent to our zero degrees Celsius. And we have one atmosphere of pressure on the bottom of the equation. So when we do the calculation, we get 22.4 liters. So that is the amount of space that one mole of an ideal gas at STP would take up. And we call that the standard molar volume. So it doesn't really matter what type of gas we're talking about. It could be helium, it could be ammonia, it could be oxygen. As long as we have one mole, that is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules or atoms, then it's gonna take up 22.4 liters of space. So we can use standard molar volume as a conversion factor to go between volume and moles because we know that 22.4 liters is equal to one mole. As long as it mentions that the problem is at STP, it has to be at STP to use the standard molar volume. It could also specify the particular conditions of one atmosphere and zero degrees Celsius, which is equivalent to STP. So if the problem says at STP, how many moles is 3.75 liters of oxygen gas? We know that we can use that 22.4 liters as a conversion factor. So anytime we use a conversion factor, we start with a number we're given, which in this case is gonna be the 3.75 liters of oxygen. That's what we're trying to convert away from. Then our conversion factor needs to have liters on the bottom to cancel out with the liters we're starting with. And we're trying to find moles, so that goes on the top. And our relationship is that 22 point liters is equal to one mole at STP. So we do 3.75 divided by 
and that gives us 0 0.167 moles of oxygen. We can modify our ideal gas law to include some different variables like density and molar mass. On this slide, I'm going to show you sort of the proof to go from the original equation, PV equals NRT, to the new form of the equation that includes density and molar mass. So we start out with the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. We can divide both sides by RT and divide both sides by V. So we come out with N over V equals P over RT. Then we can multiply both sides by the molar mass. So the molar mass we represent with a squiggly capital N. Remember, molar mass is usually grams per mole, or mass per mole, if you will. So we can rearrange that a little bit and say that molar mass times moles gives us our mass. So when we have our squiggly m in the numerator and n in the numerator that are being multiplied together, that's molar mass times moles. So instead of writing squiggly m and n, we can write mass. So we have mass divided by volume equals P over RT times the molar mass. And mass over volume is density. So we can write density D on the left side of our equal sign. And then we have pressure times molar mass divided by RT on the right side of our equal sign. So this is the new form of the equation that we can use. And it depends on what type of variables we're trying to solve for as to whether we'd want to use the original form of the equation or this form of the equation. Something to keep in mind here is that the mass is in grams and volume in our ideal gas law equation is in liters. So uh, we would have grams per liter as our density here, which is a common unit of density for gases because they take up a lot of space. So here's an example using that equation. We have a gas that was found to have a density of 0 0.0847 grams per liter at 17 degrees Celsius and a pressure of 760 torr. We want to find the molar mass of that gas and based on its molar mass, we can identify the gas. So the density is 0.0847, pressure is 760 torr, but we're probably going to want to use our ideal gas law constant, R, that has liters atmospheres per mole Kelvin. So we're gonna get our pressure from torr into atmospheres by dividing by 760. So 760 torr is equal to one atmosphere. Then we get our temperature in Kelvin. So we take our 17 degrees Celsius, add 273.15, and that gives us 290.15 Kelvin. And the value for R is 0 0.08206 liters atmospheres per mole Kelvin. Now we can plug all of those into our new equation. But we want to rearrange that equation to solve for molar mass. So what we would have to do is multiply both sides by RT and divide both sides by P. So we get molar mass, that's squiggly M, equals DRT divided by P. Then we can plug in our values, making sure that we've used the correct units. And that gives us a value of 2.02 grams per mole. So if we think about that, hydrogen is about one gram per mole. That's the single hydrogen atom. Helium is about four grams per mole. So it can't be helium, that's too big. And it can't be just one hydrogen because that's too small. So the only thing that works here is for it to be H2 gas. So in this question, you're finding the density of oxygen gas at 37 degrees Celsius and 2.3 atmospheres of pressure? The answer is A, 2.9 grams per liter. So we're using our new equation 
density equals pressure times molar mass divided by RT. And uh, so remember to get your temperature in Kelvin. Also, we're using the identity of the gas, oxygen, O2, to get our molar mass. So we would have two oxygen atoms from the periodic table. Uh, so once you plug in those values, it's just straight into the equation because we've got density by itself on one side of the equal sign, and we can solve for that density. So far, we've been talking about just one gas at a time. What happens when we have a mixture of gases? One of the things that we can use is Dalton's law of partial pressure. That tells us that the total pressure of a mixture of ideal gases equals the sum of the partial pressures of the component gases. So we can write it in equation form. P total, the total pressure, is equal to P of A plus P of B plus P of C. So like pressure of A plus pressure of B plus pressure of C and so on until you've added up the pressures of all of the gases. So if we took three canisters of gas, one that had a pressure of 300 kilopascals, a different one that had a pressure of 600 kilopascals, and then a third one that had a pressure of 450 kilopascals, and we combine them together into one container, they would have the same um, total pressure. So we'd have 300 plus 600 plus 450, making 1,350 kilopascals of pressure. So here's an example using Dalton's law. You're given the fact that you've got a 10 liter vessel and there are three gases that contains 2.50 times 10 to the minus three moles of hydrogen gas, one times 10 to the minus three moles of helium gas, and three times 10 to the minus four moles of neon gas. And question A says, what are the partial pressures of each of the gases? Question B says, what is the total pressure in atmospheres? To find the partial pressures, we're going to use the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. We know the um, volume is 10 liters. We know the number of moles of each of the gases that's given in the problem. We know R is, uh, a constant and T, the temperature, we can take that 35 degrees Celsius and change it into Kelvin. So we're going to start with the hydrogen and we're rearranging that ideal gas law to solve for pressure. So we have pressure equals NRT divided by V. The N for the hydrogen is 2.50 times 10 to the minus 3. The R value that we're using is 0 0.08206 liters atmospheres per mole Kelvin. Our temperature in Kelvin is going to end up being 308.15. That's our 35 plus 273.15. And our volume on the bottom is 10. So when we do our calculation, we get 0 0.006322 atmospheres of pressure for the hydrogen gas. Then we're going to use the ideal gas law for our next gas, which is helium. So again, we have the same rearrangement of the equation. And this is all in the same container together. So the volume, that 10 liter vessel, is going to be the volume for all three of our gases. And gases take up the space of their container, the whole space. So if we have a 10 liter container, then we have 10 liters of gas. Uh, the R is a constant, so that's not changing. The temperature is always going to be that 35 Celsius, which is 308.15 Kelvin. So the only thing that's changing for each gas is the number of moles. So in this case, with the helium, the number of moles is 1 times 10 to the minus 3. But we plug in all the other numbers the same way as before. And we come out with 0 0.002529 atmospheres. And then lastly, for the neon, Again, we have the same rearrangement of the equation, the same variables except for the number of moles. Uh, so our number of moles of the neon is 3 times 10 to the minus 4. And we come out with 0 0.000759 atmospheres of pressure for the neon. So we would say the partial pressure of hydrogen is 0 0.063, 006322. Uh, the partial pressure of helium is 0 0.002529. The partial pressure of neon 
is 0 0.000759. Uh, we're calling them partial pressures. Um, it's really just the pressure due to a particular type of gas. And it's partial because there are multiple different types of gas in the container. Uh, but we use the full ideal gas law for each of them. So our total pressure is going to be adding those three values up. So when we do that, we come out with 0 0.00961 atmospheres as our total pressure in our container. When we have a mixture of gases, the common unit of concentration that we like to use is mole fraction. So rather than talking about molarity, which would be moles per liter, we often want to use mole fraction when we're talking about mixtures of gases. So mole fraction we represent with an X, and it's going to be the number of moles of a component that is like one of the parts divided by the total number of moles of all the components, so that all the moles in the mixture. Uh, so that's expressed as X of A is equal to N of A divided by N of the total. The mole fraction of A is equal to the number of moles of A divided by the total number of moles. And we can relate mole fraction to the pressures. So the pressure of A is going to be the mole fraction of A times the total pressure. You can think of mole fraction sort of like a percent, except we're not dividing by 100 in the end. So um, we want to tell like how much of the total is made up of a, a particular part. So if we know that sort of percentage, if you will, we can multiply that by our total to get the amount of that part. That's what we're doing there with that PA equals XA times P total. So here's an example. We have a mixture that contains 2.83 moles of oxygen, 8.41 moles of nitrous oxide, and the total pressure is 192 kilopascals. So we're trying to answer two questions. What are the mole fractions of both of the substances? And what are the partial pressures of both of the substances? So let's start with the oxygen gas and first find its mole fraction. So the mole fraction of the oxygen is going to be the number of moles of oxygen divided by the total number of moles. The, to the number of moles of oxygen is 2.83. The total number of moles is the amount of the oxygen plus the nitrous oxide. So we have 2.83 plus 8.41 on the bottom. And we come out with 0 0.252. And again, we're not multiplying by 100 or dividing by 100. We're just leaving it in that decimal form. However, if we wanted to think of it as a percentage, we, we could think of it as 25.2%. Then we can take that mole fraction and multiply it by the total pressure to get the partial pressure of the oxygen. So we take our 0.252 and multiply by our 192 kilopascals, and that gives us 48.4 kilopascals. By the way, mole fraction is unitless. We're not gonna say 0.252 moles or anything like that. Just like a percentage doesn't generally have units along with it. This does not have a unit with it, it's just a fraction. So 48.4 kilopascals out of the 192 kilopascals is coming from the oxygen. Then we could do the same types of calculations for the nitrous oxide. So the mole fraction of the nitrous oxide equals the number of moles of nitrous oxide divided by the total number of moles. The number of moles of nitrous oxide is 8.41. And then again, we have our sum on the bottom, 2.83 plus 8.41. So it's really only the top part that's changing as we go from one substance to the next. And so we come out with 
0.748 as our mole fraction for the nitrous oxide. The mole fractions should add up to one, in other words, 100%. So another way that we could have figured out the mole fraction of nitrous oxide is take one and subtract the 0 0.252, which is the oxygen, and whatever is remaining must be the nitrous oxide, and that would give us that same 0 0.748. Finally, we can find the partial pressure of the nitrous oxide by taking the mole fraction and multiplying by the total pressure. So we take the 0.748 and multiply by 192 kilopascals, and that gives us 143.6 kilopascals as the pressure coming from the nitrous oxide. In other words, the partial pressure of nitrous oxide in this mixture. Another way we could have figured that number out is by taking our total pressure and subtracting the pressure of the oxygen. We know that all the pressures should add up to the total. So if we took our total pressure of 192 and subtracted the 48.4 that was coming from the oxygen, then the 143.6 must be coming from the nitrous oxide. So you're applying those same concepts to answer this question. We have a mixture of three gases that has a total pressure of 1,380 millimeters of mercury at 298 Kelvin. And we know the number of moles of each of the gases, 1.27 moles of CO2, 3.04 moles of CO, and 1.50 moles of argon. What we want to find is the partial pressure of the argon. The answer is B. 356 millimeters of mercury. So you're going to first solve for the mole fraction of the argon by taking the moles of argon, which is 1.50, and dividing by the total number of moles. So we would have our 1.27 plus the 3.04 plus the 1.50 on the bottom. Once we have that mole fraction, we're going to multiply by our total pressure of 1,380 millimeters of mercury. And that gives us our 356 millimeters of mercury, which is B. One lab technique that's commonly done is collection of gases over water. So when we're doing experiments with gases in the lab, we have to pay attention to the atmospheric pressure, the pressure on uh, the outsides of our containers. And if the water level uh, in uh, an apparatus is the same on the inside and the outside of a bottle or a gas burette, then we would say that the pressure on the inside of the container is equal to the atmospheric pressure uh, on the outside of the container. And we can measure that atmospheric pressure with a barometer or look it up on weather.com. So we can express this in equation form that our total pressure of gases inside the container is going to equal the atmospheric pressure on the outside of the container. So when we collect a gas over water, it's going through the tubing and then it bubbles up into the water and it ends up rising to the top uh, because it's less dense than the water. And uh, so along with the gas that's being collected from the reaction, there's also some water vapor along with it. Particles at the surface of the water, some of them have enough energy to escape into the gas phase. And so there's always a little bit of water vapor above any sample of liquid water. So our total pressure of the gases in the container are going to equal the pressure of the water plus the pressure of the gas that we're collecting. So the vapor pressure of water, we can generally look it up in a table or apply this graph that's on this slide. What we notice is that the vapor pressure goes up as the temperature goes up. But because it's not linear, it's generally easiest to just look up the value in a table.
So here's an example of some calculations that go along with collecting a gas over water. So we have 0 0.200 liters of argon gas being collected over water at a temperature of 26 degrees Celsius and a pressure of 750 torr. And what we want to find is the partial pressure of the argon that we're collecting. So we know that our total pressure is going to equal the pressure of the argon plus the vapor pressure of water. So we could rearrange that to solve for the pressure of the argon. So pressure of the argon is equal to total pressure minus the vapor pressure of water. The total pressure is given to us in this problem as 750 torr. The vapor pressure of water, you would have to look up in the table or on that graph. And what we find is that at 26 degrees Celsius, the corresponding pressure value for the vapor pressure of water is 25.2 torr. So we can take our 750 torr of total pressure and subtract our 25.2 torr, which is the pressure of the water, and that gives us 725 torr as the pressure of the argon. As you're doing that subtraction, the units do all have to be the same as each other. You can't mix units. So you have to do it all in torr or all in atmospheres, all in kilopascals, whatever the case may be. But those units have to be consistent. So we've talked about Avogadro's law, which tells us that the moles and the volume are directly proportional. And we talked a bit about what this means for our chemical equations and the coefficients. So the moles reacting with moles to make moles, or we could write it as volume reacting with volume to make volume. So for example, we have one volume of nitrogen combining with three volumes of hydrogen to make two volumes of ammonia. Because of that, we can do stoichiometry problems based on Avogadro's law. We're just gonna do it with liters instead of moles. So in this example, we have propane gas and it's reacting with oxygen gas to make carbon dioxide and water. This is a combustion reaction. And we want to find what volume of oxygen gas at 25 degrees Celsius and 760 torr is needed to react with 2.7 liters of propane measured under the same conditions of temperature and pressure. It is going to be important for our stoichiometry type problems here that the conditions are the same. And usually that will be the case anytime you're doing a reaction. The, the conditions are not likely to change in terms of temperature and pressure. Uh, but if they do change, um, that can actually affect um, the, the way you calculate the problem. So we're gonna start with our value that we're trying to convert from, which is our 2.7 liters of propane. And we're gonna use our coefficients in our balanced chemical equation the same way we did, would for any other stoichiometry problem, except instead of writing moles, we're gonna write liters. So we're gonna go from liters of propane to liters of oxygen. So we have uh, one in our balanced equation next to the propane, five in our equation next to the oxygen, and we have the units of liters next to each of those. So we do 2.7 times five, and that gives us 13.5 liters of oxygen. Here's another stoichiometry problem with gases that we can do. This one's gonna be a little bit trickier in a way because we're gonna to have to use the ideal gas law. But the basic setup of the stoichiometry is actually more similar to what we've done before in that we are going to use moles for our conversion. So here's the basic layout of the problem. We're going to go from mass of gallium to moles of gallium using the molar mass of gallium. And we're going to go from moles of gallium to moles of hydrogen using the balanced chemical equation. And then we can go from moles of hydrogen to volume of hydrogen using the ideal gas law. So that's really the new part of this problem. So we start with our 8.88 grams of gallium that we're given in the problem. 
and convert it to moles by dividing by the molar mass of gallium, which is 69.723 grams per mole. Then we go from moles of gallium to moles of hydrogen using our coefficients. So moles of gallium goes on the bottom to cancel out, and it has a 2 next to it in the balanced chemical equation. Moles of hydrogen goes on the top, and there's a 3 next to it in the balanced chemical equation. So we can do 8.88 .8 divided by 69.723 times 3 divided by 2, and that gives us 0 0.191 moles of hydrogen. Here's the new part of this. We're going to use the ideal gas law to solve for volume. So we rearrange it to get V by itself on one side of the equal sign. So we have V equals NRT divided by P. Our number of moles we just solved for is moles of the galley of, rather, moles of the uh, oxygen, uh, moles of the hydrogen, rather, that we're collecting. Um, and that's uh, our 0 0.191 that we just solved for. Our, the value for R that we're using is 0 0.08206, again, liters, atmospheres per mole Kelvin. We're given that in the problem. Uh, our temperature is given to us as 27 degrees Celsius, so we add 273.15 and get 300.15 when we plug that in. And then the pressure was given to us as 723 torr. But our value for R needs it to be in atmospheres. So we take our 723 and divide by 760, which gives us 0.9513 atmospheres. And that goes on the bottom. So once we have everything in the correct units that match our units for R, then we do our calculation and come out with 4.95 liters. So here's a question for you to try. What volume of carbon dioxide measured at 745 torr and 25 degrees Celsius can be produced by the fermentation of 10 grams of glucose? And then you're given several pieces of information that help you solve the problem, including the balanced chemical equation. The answer is C, 2.77 liters. So you're going to have to change grams of glucose into moles of glucose using the molar mass given in the problem, and then moles of glucose into moles of CO2. Once you have the moles of CO2, you can plug that into your ideal gas law, PB equals NRT. That would be plugged in for N, the number of moles. The pressure needs to be in atmospheres in order to match up with your units of R. So you'll take your 745 divided by 760. Temperature has to be in Kelvin, so you'll add your 25 plus 273.15, and you can plug that in with your value of R and come out with the volume of carbon dioxide. So we're going to be talking about some properties of gases. One property is diffusion. So molecules of gas are going to move from areas of high concentration of that particular gas to areas of low concentration of that gas. So let's say we start with uh, two gases, hydrogen and oxygen, and they're separated by each other with a stopcock. Then we open it up and allow them to start mixing two together. So the random motion of the molecules is going to cause them to move. And um, they're going to start moving into each other's territory, if you will. Eventually, they're going to end up with equal concentrations on both sides of the container. So there will be an equal amount of the hydrogen on each side, and there will be an equal amount of the oxygen on each side. So the uh, end result is basically the same, but the rate of diffusion is going to depend on the size of the gas, the, the mass of the gas. So uh, the rate of diffusion is measured as the amount of gas passing through a particular area in a given amount of time. And the lighter the gas, the faster it's going to diffuse. So hydrogen is going to go through uh, much more quickly than the oxygen will. 
Uh, so if we look at the colored dots, the hydrogen is the white. And when the stopcock first opens, there's actually quite a bit of white getting over to the other side, but not all that much red. Uh, and that's because the oxygen is diffusing more slowly. But eventually, the red does get through. Another property of gases is effusion. So effusion is escape of gas molecules through a tiny hole, like, like a pinhole in a balloon, into a vacuum. Uh, so effusion and escape um, both start with E. Uh, so that's one way to remember it. And so uh, diffusion, they're spreading around a container. Effusion, they're starting in a container and passing out through a tiny opening, a tiny hole. And um, for based on the definition, uh, they're gonna escape one molecule at a time. So it's like a really, really tiny hole. So there's a law of effusion called Graham's law of effusion. And I'm not really gonna make you memorize the equation, but basically it says the rate of effusion is inversely proportional to the square root of the mass of its particles. In other words, the heavier the molecule, the more slowly it will effuse and the lighter molecules will effuse more quickly. So this is really the same effect as diffusion. Um, the, in both cases, the heavier is gonna be more slow and the lighter is gonna be faster. But they're coming from two different principles, um, two different um, effects are happening and they have two different equations that apply to them. It just turns out that the same uh, sort of relative thing happens. So if we look at a pair of balloons, um, one is filled with helium and the other is filled with nitrogen, the gases can escape through tiny holes in the latex of the balloon. And so um, the helium is going to escape more quickly because it's smaller. So it's more likely to when it's going to collide with the hole, it's more likely to collide straight on and be able to pass through. Whereas the nitrogen being bigger is more likely to sort of bump into the edge and end up going back inside. So um, based on the relative size of the molecule compared to the size of the hole, that's where effusion uh, sort of gets its strength. So uh, the helium is going to be slow, uh, faster because it's smaller and the nitrogen is gonna be slower because it's larger. So we're going to be trying to picture our gas molecules on a molecular level and uh, get an idea of what they're like, what they tend to do. So we have a theory called kinetic molecular theory that helps us picture what our molecules are doing. And these are things that we are generally going to assume to be true about a gas. So number one, gases are composed of molecules that are in continuous motion. They're always moving around. They're traveling in straight lines and they only change direction when they collide with other molecules or the wall of a container. So they go in these straight lines and they bump into things and they go in a new angle, but still at a straight line. Number two, the molecules are small compared to the distances between the molecules. So there's a lot of empty space in between gas molecules and the molecules themselves are so much smaller compared to that empty space that we can assume that they're, they're negligibly small. We can um, not count them as the, the size of the molecules as part of our calculations most of the time. Number three, the pressure is going to result from collisions between the gas molecules and the walls of their container. So as the gas molecules bounce off of the sides of their container, that's creating pressure. Number four, gas molecules exert no attractive or repulsive forces on each other or on the container walls. And so when they collide with each other or with the walls of their container, 
those collisions are assumed to be elastic, which means that there's no loss of energy as a result of the collision. So they bump into each other and they go away from each other with the same energy that they had going into the collision. And number five, the average kinetic energy of the gas molecules is proportional, directly proportional, to the Kelvin temperature of the gas. So the higher the temperature in Kelvin, the more kinetic energy it's going to have. So we're going to think about our gas laws that we talked about um, at the beginning of the chapter and think about them in terms of what the atoms and molecules are doing. So if we heat something up, that is adding energy to the molecules. So the molecules have an increased kinetic energy, which means they're moving around faster. Uh, and that faster movement means they're going to be more likely to bump into each other. And they're also more likely to bump into the walls of their container. And so that having more collisions is going to result in a greater pressure because it's bumping into the wall of the container more. So this leads us to Amontin's law, which says that as the temperature is increased, the pressure will also increase. So pressure and temperature are directly proportional. We can also relate kinetic molecular theory to Charles's law. Charles's law tells us that volume and temperature are directly proportional. So let's say we have a piston that can move up and down. And at the beginning, the gas pressure on the inside equals the atmospheric pressure on the outside. If we increase the temperature, that's going to make the molecules inside collide more. And as they collide more, there's going to be sort of a temporary increase in pressure. Um, so the, the gas is going to push on that piston and, and sort of push it upwards. Um, so it's going to expand its volume because it's, it's a movable piston. So that volume is going to expand until the gas pressure equals the atmospheric pressure again. So heating up the molecules ended up causing an increase in volume. We can also think of kinetic molecular theory in terms of Boyle's law. Boyle's law tells us pressure and volume are inversely proportional. So let's say we have a container with a piston and we push the piston down with force. As we close that volume and make it smaller, that decreased volume leads to more collisions because they have less space to move around in. They're more likely to bump into each other and they're more likely to bump into the walls of their container. And because there are more collisions, there's increased pressure. So decreased volume led to increased pressure. And we can think about kinetic molecular theory with Avogadro's law. So Avogadro's law tells us that moles and volume are directly proportional. So if we increase our number of moles of a particular gas, that should increase the frequency of collisions, which should increase the pressure. But again, if we can um, have a piston that's able to move, um, or let's say it's in a balloon, um, then it's able to expand. Uh, so if we want to keep pressure constant, the volume is going to increase uh, in order to compensate for that increasing number of moles and, and the increasing collisions. We can also look at kinetic molecular theory and Dalton's law of partial pressures. We've mentioned as one of the postulates of kinetic molecular theory that the gas molecules are very small compared to the empty spaces between them. So there's a lot of empty space that other gases can sort of slip into. So when we mix different gases together, they're just gonna fill in some of that empty space, but they're so small compared to the empty space, it's really as if they're not even there in terms of what the other gas is doing. So the frequency of collisions, in other words, the pressure of one gas is not affected by the frequency of collisions of another gas. So our total pressure can just 
add up the pressures of the individual gases. I encourage you to go to the slides and click on the link that says FET Gas Simulator. Or you can Google search PHET and um, there's a really great simulation of uh, gas molecules. So you can see what happens when you change molar masses, change different temperatures, and really get a mental picture of what's going on on a molecular level. So we've mentioned ideal gases, and basically an ideal gas is one that's going to follow the laws of kinetic molecular theory. But not every gas is going to fit all of those postulates perfectly. Um, so one of the ways we can measure how close to ideal a gas is, is by using something called a compressibility factor. So that's a comparison of the gas's true volume to what it would be if it were ideal, which is 22.4 liters per mole. And so what we find is that the ideal gas law doesn't work very well at high pressures or low temperatures. So with high pressures, we're taking away some of that empty space between the molecules. So the molecules are closer together and they're taking up more space relative to the amount of the container. And so the volume of the molecules themselves actually starts to become important if it becomes very compressed. So the more compressed it is, that is the smaller the volume, the volume of the molecules themselves ends up becoming more important and it deviates from ideal behavior. The same thing is also going to be true for low temperature in that the molecules are going to be moving around less and they sort of congregate together a little bit more. Um, there's going to be less empty space in between them. So if there's smaller distances between the atoms, there are going to be more attractive forces. So that's another uh, postulate of kinetic molecular theory that's starting to break down. The atoms are going to stick together more. And so the volume of the gas that gets measured is going to be less than expected based on ideal behavior. Uh, so if we hold uh, pressure the same, the volume will be less. Or if uh, the volume is held constant, uh, the pressure is going to be less. In order to account for non-ideal behavior, we can modify the ideal gas law into a new form of the equation called the van der Waals equation. The van der Waals equation has a few corrective terms built into it, but it's still in basically the same form as PV equals NRT. The NRT part of it is completely unchanged. Uh, there's still a pressure term, but it's got a modifier, and there's still a volume term, but it has a modifier. And in those modifiers, there are some constants A and B, which can be looked up in a table for a particular type of gas. So with PV equals NRT, we could use that for any gas, as long as we're assuming that it's doing ideal gas behavior. With the van der Waals equation, we can be more specific to a particular gas, like hydrogen gas or nitrogen gas or ammonia gas, and we can look it up in the table for the A and B values. And so it's going to give us a lot more precision about what it, its um, variables actually are, but it does make the equation more complicated. So this slide is here for your reference. So you can find those A and B constants for several different gases. So here's an example using the van der Waals equation. We're actually first going to use the ideal gas law, and then we'll use the van der Waals equation and compare the two answers to each other and see how close they get. The, the ideal gas law is easier to use. The van der Waals equation will actually be more correct for that particular substance. So we have a 4.25 liter flask containing 3.46 moles of CO2 at 229 degrees Celsius. 
we want to solve for pressure. So with our ideal gas law, PV equals NRT, if we want to solve for pressure, we would divide both sides by V. We come out with P equals NRT divided by V. And the number of moles is 3.46. The value for R is 0 0.08206 liters atmospheres per mole Kelvin. Our temperature in Kelvin is 502.15 Kelvin. So we had to take our Celsius and change it into Kelvin there. And we divide by our 4.25 liters, which is our volume. And we come out with 33.5 atmospheres of pressure. Now let's use the Van der Waals equation for part B. So in our Van der Waals equation, we don't have pressure by itself on one side of the equal sign yet. So we're going to have to do some rearranging to get pressure by itself. So the first thing we would do is divide both sides by V minus NB. That's in one of our parentheses. And then we would subtract AN squared over V squared from both sides. So we end up with pressure equals NRT divided by V minus NB, and then subtract AN squared over V squared. Again, check your algebra. Once we've rearranged it to get pressure by itself, we can plug in our values. We plug in N, which is 3.46 moles. We plug in R, which is 0 0.08206 liters atmospheres per mole Kelvin. We plug in our temperature in Kelvin, which is 502.15. On the bottom, we have volume, which is 4.25 liters. And then we subtract N times B. N is our number of moles, which is again that 3.46 moles, and B is specifically for CO2. So you would look up the value for B for CO2 in the table on the previous slide, and we would find that it's 0 0.0427. Then we're taking that whole term and subtracting the AN squared over V squared. So the A for CO2 is going to be 3.59. Again, you have to look that up in the table. N is going to be 3.46 moles, and we're going to square that. And V, the volume of 4.25 liters, will also be squared, and that's on the bottom. So if you're very, very careful with your parentheses, you may be able to do this all in your calculator at once, but you're going to really want to make sure that you're doing it properly. Uh, so let's say we just do one term at a time. Our first term would give us 34.755. Our second term would give us 2.379. And that gives, uh, when we subtract those, we get 32.4 atmospheres. So here's a question in which you get to try using the Van der Waals equation. You have ammonia gas, and it has a pressure of um, what we're trying to find. We are given one mole of that ammonia gas at 27 degrees Celsius, and it's in a 750 milliliter container. The values for A and B have been supplied for you in the problem. The answer is D, 27.1 atmospheres. So you're going to have the same rearrangement as in the previous problem, because we're solving for pressure again. So you would rearrange it the same algebraic way, and you're going to plug in the values similar to what we did before. Uh, change your temperature from Celsius into Kelvin. Change your volume from milliliters into liters. And then you can basically plug things in and solve for the 27.1 atmospheres.